Welcome to the 144,000. Who are they? Where are they? And what do they do? Can we answer these questions according to the Bible? Or is the 144,000 a number that's given twice in the book of Revelation so symbolic or figurative that it's not meant to be understood right now? Let's get right to those two sections of Revelation. We're going to read them together. Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. We're going to see how the 144,000 are there described. And then we're going to use the Bible, primarily the New Testament writings, to try to answer these questions. Now, some sections of the New Testament that I'm going to read will involve a good amount of the context. But because, as you'll see, the descriptions that we're going to read about the 144,000, because the descriptions are, are specific in certain ways, that potential parallels to how they are described in other books of the Bible and in Revelation, other parts of Revelation, they don't require an extensive reading of every context because the parallel descriptions that are given in certain texts aren't a part of the main narrative or what's being discussed in those other New Testament sections. So I'm going to read the context to the extent that I think it will be necessary and helpful to determine if what we're reading in other parts of the Bible are consistent with what we're going to read right now and Revelation 14 and 7. So let's get right to it. I'm going to bring up the New World Translation pre-2013. You can use whatever Bible translation you want, but I'm very familiar with the New World Translation. It's not as terrible as so many non-Jehovah's Witnesses or anti-Watchtower people believe. And if you think it is, if you think there's a problem, then you can put down your concern and complaint and we'll try to discuss it. Otherwise, Use whatever copy of the Bible you want, and let's discuss it. All right, let's get right to it. Revelation chapter 7. This is the first description, the first mention of the explicit number 144,000 in the Bible. So let's take a look at it. Let's just see what it says, and then we'll go from there. We'll read Revelation 14, see what it says. And because we are dealing with a book that is presented in signs, Revelation 1.1 says it's a revelation that God gave to Jesus. It's a disclosure of divine information. That's what a revelation is. That Jesus didn't have before this. That his God, the God he refers to as his God in Revelation 3.2 and 12, and elsewhere like John 20.17, gave to him. It's information that the resurrected Jesus in heaven did not have. So he not only does not know the day and the hour when he will arrive at God's command in God's glory to separate the sheep and the goats, because he tells us explicitly only the Father knows that day. There are all kinds of things that because he's not equal to the Father, the Father is greater than him. He's not exactly like the Father in every way, including age, knowledge, and other descriptions. He's given this disclosure of divine information. He didn't already have it, is what I'm saying. But once he had it, once he was given it by his God, the one God, God the Father, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, he then presented it to John, one of his servants, whom many believe, including me, was his beloved disciple. And then John presented it to the other Christians of his day. So not everything in Revelation is presented in a literal sense. A lot of what is in Revelation is is depicted in a heavenly vision and communicated to humans using images and descriptions that we understand as humans. So keep that in mind 
we'll determine just how much that may relate to the 144,000 as we begin. But Revelation is not a book that's meant to be taken literal in every respect. Sometimes it is. So that's what we need to determine in our discussion today. Let's take a look. Revelation 7, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. We'll note the descriptions. And then we're going to go to Revelation 14, note those descriptions. And then we're going to see if we can identify whom is being discussed in these texts. Revelation 7, verse 1. After this, I saw... This is from the perspective of John, the one to whom the revelation is given, Revelation 1.1. After this I saw four angels standing upon the four corners of the earth, holding tight the four winds of the earth. And this is an instance where a number could be literal or figurative. There are four primary winds that have been identified as circulating about the earth. But, of course, there are also many other winds. But there actually are four primary winds. And so what is stated here is atmospherically correct. Although there, could, there are other winds in addition to those four primary winds. And so, again, we might be able to take this literal in one sense, but not in another. Holding tight the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow upon the earth or upon the sea, or upon any tree. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the sun rising, having a seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth, or the sea, or the trees, until after... We have sealed the slaves of our God in their foreheads. So they're referred to as sealed, slaves of God, and having a seal in their forehead. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of every tribe of the sons of Israel. Verse 5, out of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. Out of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Verse 6, out of the tribe of Asher, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Verse 7, out of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Levi, 12,000. Out of the tribe, tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Verse 8, out of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Out of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. Verse 9 goes on to talk about a great crowd that can't be numbered, at least not by man. And that's out of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And so it's different descriptively from the ones who are sealed, numbered, and sealed out of the twelve tribes of Israel that are listed here in Revelation 1 through 8. Now, I've done a separate video that I put a link in the description below about the great crowd of Revelation 7 and 19. So if you'd like more information, check it out. We're going to focus on the 144,000 right now. So just to reiterate, verses 1 through 8 talk about a number. It's given as a 144,000 number and then multiplied by 12 tribes and 12,000. They're said to be slaves of God with a seal on their forehead. And they're called out of the sons of Israel. Now we'll talk about that more in a minute, but they're referred to as sons here. So keep that in mind as well. Now let's go down to Revelation chapter 14. The second instance in which the 144,000 are explicitly described and identified by that number. So we'll take a look at Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. 
and eyes, this is John, and I saw and look, the Lamb standing upon Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty four thousand, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Remember in Revelation 7, they were sealed in their foreheads. Here, they're described locationally as with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Having the Lamb's name and the name of the Lamb's Father on their foreheads. There's no mention of the name of the Holy Spirit here. I'm sure you could tell that, but I wanted to point it out because it's pretty significant since Trinitarians make such a big deal about God being three persons. Whereas here, there are only two, and they each have a name. It's not one name. It's the name of the Lamb and the name of his Father written on the 144,000's forehead, which seems to be, if we connect it with Revelation 7, which we just read, the seal that's on their forehead. Let's continue. And I heard a sound out of heaven as the sound of many waters and as the sound of loud thunder. And the sound that I heard was as of singers who accompany themselves on the harp playing on their harps. You know, the instrument of a harp. Verse 3, and they are singing as if a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one was able to master that song but the 144,000 who have been bought from the earth. All right, so we now have a further description. They're singing. Their sound is coming out of heaven. They're playing harps. They're singing a new song. They're different from the four living creatures and elders. And only the 144,000 can master this song. They've been bought from the earth. Verse 4. These are the ones who did not defile themselves with women. In fact, they are virgins. These are the ones that keep following the Lamb no matter where he goes. These were bought from among mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Verse 5, And no falsehood was found in their mouths. They the 144,000, are without blemish. Okay, so let's just go through it again. Here the 144,000 are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. They have the name of His name and the name of His Father on their foreheads. They're singing, and the sound of their singing comes out of heaven, and they're playing on harps. They're singing a new song. They're not the four living creatures or elders. And only they can master the song. They've been bought from the earth, that was said twice, as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They are said to have not defiled themselves with women. And it goes on to describe them as virgins. And so... This kind of suggests that they're only men, possibly, right? Although it could be women who just didn't defile themselves with women, you know, like as lesbos. So, let's keep that in mind, though. Are these only males? They seem to be described as males, but again, I just mentioned there could be a reason why they could be women and not defiling themselves with women. And it says they're virgins. All right. No falsehood without blemish. What do these descriptions mean? Do they mean exactly what they say? Is If it says they're virgins, is just, that's what they are? Well, it could be. But again, 
we're talking about visions given to John after Jesus received the revelation, the disclosure of divine information, and he presents it in signs, right? We know it's describing them in ways that are material, right? Plain harps. And while there could be some kind of spiritual instrument like a harp in a way, it doesn't say it that way, right? It just says harp. So again, is it a literal reference to a harp, but that is a spiritualized harp? We can't really tell from just this reading, right? So we, we have two options really, right? We can take this reading exactly as it says, which would then mean that Jesus is really a lamb in one sense, right? Either he's a lamb or he's not a lamb. So if he's a lamb but not a lamb, then it's obviously a figurative description of him as a lamb in that he was the sacrifice that was provided for us like lambs were provided a sacrifice before his sacrifice. So there's references here that if we take too literally, or even just literally, they're not going to make much sense. So there's a basis for both a literal and non-literal reading of these texts. But we are in Revelation. So that gives us a basis right there for determining whether or not we're dealing with signs presented in visions involving heavenly things like right here. Right? They're, they're singing out of heaven. The Lamb is standing on Mount Zion. And so if he's in heaven where they are, because that's where their, their singing is coming from, then it wouldn't seem to be a literal mountain, would it? All right, so we have a basis really for either one, symbolic or literal. But there's a lot of things in here that don't seem literal. But is all of it not literal? Right? I mean, they're singing, so singing is singing. It's as the voice of uh, sound of loud thunder and waters, though, right? So it's not normal singing. But then we get more just basic references to not being defiled with women and being virgins. So not not doesn't seem to be a whole lot of symbolism there. But the whole revelation is presented in signs. And we're describing, we're seeing described here something that's in heaven. But maybe this is something literal that was when they were on the earth, right? Because they're bought from among mankind. So were they bought from among mankind as virgins? Let's take all of these descriptions that we just read from Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 and see if we can identify further how the early Christians used these types of descriptions. Do we have other texts in the New Testament, they use virgins, falsehood, no blemish, harps, Mount Zion, in ways that would help us make sense of these descriptions in a non-literal sense, right? So if, if other parts of the New Testament regularly use these same descriptions in a non-literal sense, well, that would provide a pretty strong basis for understanding the use of these same terms in a book of signs in a non-literal sense. So let's see what we have. Let's talk first about this number. Right? Is this number, this 144,000, literal? Or is it a figurative number that stands for a definite number? Right? It can still be a definite number, but the number given to the number not be literal. Let me explain what I mean. So let's just go back to another section in Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. Right before the first appearance of the 144,000 that we read in chapter 7, look at what it says in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. Verse 9, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those slaughtered because of the word of God and because of the witness work that they used to have. And they, that is the souls under the altar who were killed because of the witness work they used to have, they cry out with a loud voice. Until when? 
Sovereign Lord, holy and true, are you refraining from judging and avenging our blood upon those who dwell on the earth? Verse 11, And a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the number was filled. Also of their fellow slaves and their brothers who were about to be killed as they also had been. So we get again this reference to a number being filled of their brothers who are also their fellow slaves. And then, as we re read earlier, and it goes on to state that number is given as 144,000. So is, is that the, the definite number, right? Have, have these people been killed who are under the altar and they're not 144,000 literally yet, but that number is about to be filled up? And then as soon as that number is 144,000 exactly, then their blood will be avenged? Well, we're going to look up, we're going to read on, but just note again that this idea of a number being filled is given elsewhere in Revelation, specifically to people who are called brothers and fellow slaves. Now let's go to a section of text that's going to involve our longest continuous reading because it's important that we get the context. But it's so important for understanding what we just read. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. All right, so we've got Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 giving us this number, 144,000, along with all these other descriptions. But right now, we're just focused on this number. Right? Is this number literal or figurative? Right? See, it, we get it kind of the same thing in Revelation 6, 11, right? the number being filled Excuse me. Well, where else outside of Revelation do we get this idea of a number, if at all, for Christians? Let's take a look. Revelation chapter 11. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 through 32. Very important. So this is the section I'd like you to pay the most attention to because several points are going to be made that tie directly into the descriptions we read in Revelation 6, 7, and 14. Paul writes, I ask then, God did not reject his people, did he? Never may that happen, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the tribes that we read in Revelation 7. Verse 2, God did not reject his people whom he first recognized. Why, do you not know what the scripture says in connection with Elijah as he pleads with God against Israel? Verse 3, Jehovah, they have killed your prophets. They have dug up your altars. I alone am left and they are looking for my soul. We've read a little bit about some of the things involving Elijah in our recent text readings. But back to this section of texts. And the divine name is used in the New World Translation, as I've discussed elsewhere, and as the NWT and the Watchtower Society have discussed as well. Because there are times when, in the New Testament, even though we don't have the original writings, it's quoting from or referring to the Old Testament ways that seem explicitly to involve the God of the Old Testament or the divine name. And we know from our copies of the Septuagint pre-first century and post that the divine name was there in the first century in the Septuagint. And then it was taken out and replaced with abbreviated forms of titles like Lord, which was also then done to the New Testament because the Septuagint was considered inspired long before the New Testament was. I've talked about that separately in other videos, but I want to mention it here in case you haven't watched those. Verse 4, Yet what does the divine pronouncement say to him? I have left 7,000 men over for myself, men who have not bent the knee to Baal. Verse 5, In this way, therefore, at the present season, in the first century, also a remnant has turned up according to a choosing due to undeserved kindness. Right, And Paul is 
starting out by saying he's one of those. Verse 6, now, if it is by undeserved kindness, it is no longer due to works. Otherwise, the undeserved kindness no longer proves to be undeserved kindness. Verse 7, what then? The very thing Israel is earnestly seeking, he did not obtain. But the ones chosen obtained it. The rest had their sensibilities blunted. Verse 8, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of deep sleep. Eyes so as not to see and ears so as not to hear. Down to this very day. Right, he's talking about their rejection of the Messiah, whom they were originally seeking, but whom many of them rejected and only a, a select chosen, a remnant turned up according to a choosing. Verse 9, also David says, let their table become for them a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution. Let their eyes become darkened so as not to see and always bow down their back. Verse 11, now Paul resumes after quoting those texts, Therefore I ask, did they stumble so that they fell completely? Never may that happen. But by their false step, there is salvation to the people of the nations. To incite them to jealousy, to incite Israel to jealousy. Verse 12, now if their false step, if their failure to recognize the Messiah ends up being an opportunity for salvation to the people of the nations, if their false step means riches to the world, and their decrease means riches to the people of the nations, how much more will the full number of them mean it. Verse 13, now I speak to you who are people of the nations. Right? So he's not writing to Jews here. There may be some Jews, right, like him, but he's pretty much writing to the Gentiles, right? Even though Jews, Jewish Christians may have read this letter. He's writing to the nations. For as much as I am in reality, Romans in this case, in reality an apostle of the nations, I glorify my ministry. Keep this in mind. How much more will the full number of them, meaning Israel, mean it? Verse 14, if I may by any means incite those who are my own flesh, literal Jews, to jealousy and save some from among them. Verse 15, for if the casting of them away means reconciliation for the world, what will the receiving of them mean but life from the dead? Further, if the first fruits is holy, the first fruits, just like we read in Revelation 14, bought from among mankind as first fruits. If the first fruits is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are also. However, verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off, but you, people of the nations, although being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became a sharer of the olive's root of fatness, do not be exulting over the branches. If, though, you are exulting over them, it is not by you, it is not you that bear the root, but the root that bears you. Right? So Israel is the root in this case, the first fruits, who even though they were decreased, it meant riches to people of the nations, the branches that are grafted in, they shouldn't lose sight of the fact that they're being grafted into what? the root, the first fruits. 
Verse 19, you will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in, right? So you got rid of the, those Jews who wouldn't accept the Messiah. Now we of the nations who are accepting the Messiah get our opportunity. We're grafted in to the root. Verse 20, all right, for their lack of faith, they were broken off, but you are standing by faith. Quit having lofty ideas, but be in fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Verse 22. See therefore God's kindness and severity. Toward those who fell, there is severity. But toward you, there is God's kindness. Provided you remain in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be lopped off. So much for once saved, always saved. Another false teaching of many people who claim to be Christians today. Verse 23, they also, if they do not remain in their lack of faith, will be grafted in so they can come back. For God is able to graft them in again. The branches that were cut off that rejected his son. Verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree that is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into the garden olive tree, how much rather will these who are natural be grafted into their own olive tree? Should be even easier, right? Because that's where they come from. But they're all still part of the same tree. The original branches have been broken off. New ones have been grafted in. But the original ones can still be grafted back in. In fact, it would be even easier, you would think, according to the analogy given by Paul. Verse 25. For I do not want you, brothers, to be ignorant of this sacred secret in order for you not to be discreet in your own eyes that a dulling of sensibilities has happened in part to Israel until the full number of people of the nations has come in. What did Revelation 6, 9 through 11 say to those who are slaughtered because of the witness work they had and they cry out under the altar, when are you going to avenge our blood, O sovereign Lord? Rest a little while longer until the number of your fellow slaves, your brothers, have been sealed, have been filled. Here, before that revelation was given, Paul wrote that a dulling of sensibilities has happened in part to Israel until the full number of the people of the nations come in. And in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion and turn away ungodly practices from Jacob. It specifically states right here in the context that we've been reading in Romans 11 that not only can the foreign branches be grafted into the first fruits, but that the way in which Israel is saved is by the full number of people of the nations coming in to the first fruits root of the same tree that these Jews can still be grafted back into. Verse 27, we're going to go to verse 32. And this is the covenant on my part with them when I take away their sins. Verse 28, true, with reference to the good news, they are enemies for your sake, right? The Jews opposing them right now who are not accepting the Christ, like Paul. But with reference to God's choosing, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are not things he will regret. They, they still have the opportunity of seeing the fulfillment of the promises made through Abraham as his seed, as his literal seed of the flesh. Although we have those promises now passed on to us by the Spirit. We'll get to it. Verse 30. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy 
because of their disobedience, so also these now have been disobedient with mercy resulting to you that they themselves also may be shown mercy. Verse 32, For God has shut them up together in disobedience that he might show all of them mercy. This is such an important section of text when you're dealing with the 144,000 revelation because of the way in which it shows very clearly that the first fruits is holy, as is the lump, and if the root is holy, the branches are also by being grafted into it. And by the grafting in of the people of the nations, that is how, the full, with the full number of the people of the nations, all Israel will be saved. It's a direct connection, at least it seems to me, based on the filling up of the number. And Israel as it is described in Revelation 7, in Revelation 6 and 7, it ties in directly with Paul, what Paul is talking about right here in Romans chapter 11. So this, this number, this number that is given of 144,000, Revelation 7 and 14, in a book of signs, in which other numbers are given that aren't always literal as they are described, but it could, right? I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying when you look at the context, including Revelation 6, 9 through 11, and how the number would be filled of their brothers, their fellow slaves who had the witness work to God. And when you look at how Paul writes about the first fruits root, having grafted into it the branches that are the people of the nations, and that when the full number of the people of the nations are grafted in, in that way, all Israel is saved, though the original branches can also still be grafted in. Why? Because if they don't remain, if the people of the nations don't remain in God's undeserved kindness, his mercy, they'll be chopped off as well. And then, of course, the same thing could happen with the Jews who were who were not accepting Christ. They could accept Christ, and so they could then displace the people of the nations who reject him. Why? Because they don't remain in his kindness. So Paul's pointing it out. Look, if he was this severe to his own chosen people, and he cut them off so that people of the nations could be saved, and by the full number of them coming in, all Israel be saved. If you don't remain grafted into that root as the first fruits, you can be chopped off. Or like Revelation, Jesus himself says, you can be blotted out. You can have your name in, but it can be blotted out. And then other names can be written in. Or other people can be grafted in. So I think that really helps provide a better understanding of how this number of 144,000 can be understood other than literal. It could still be literal. But when you have descriptions given like this, for all Israel, right? And then you have Israel described in a spiritual 12 tribe listing in Revelation. There, it doesn't seem like there's a difference when you combine the descriptions that are given in 7 and 14 about them being from all Israel and being first fruits, and Paul describing how the first fruits had the branches broken off so new branches, people of the nations, could be grafted in, and the full number of those people of the nations being the salvation of all Israel. There seems to be a pretty explicit connection made there. Though I wouldn't say it's impossible still for there to be a difference. They're both talking about a full number coming in just like Revelation 6 and 7 and the reference to 104,000 in 14, Revelation 14. So this idea of a number really seems to me to relate to this grafting in of the people of the nations. 
and how while they can be lopped off and other Jews come in, there's also more that is said, as we're going to get to, about what it means to be a Jew. Right? It, Paul goes on to describe, as we'll read later, in Romans 2, how a Jew is not one who's circumcised of the flesh, but of the heart. And so there's this spiritual Jew that Paul talks about in this same letter. In fact, let's just go ahead and go to it right now, since it ties in uh, so well with what we're going to be talking about. Let's go to Romans 2, right? So we have right here a clear description of a number of people of the nations coming in, and in that manner all Israel being saved in relation to the first fruits. And then earlier in this same letter, in verse 28 and 29, Paul says he is not a Jew, right? So earlier, right before he did that whole discussion about the first fruits, the root and the branches, the people of the nations being grafted in, he made it clear that he is not a Jew who is one on the outside, nor is circumcision that which is on the outside upon the flesh, showing that it's not a literal sense in which he's talking about Jews or Israel. Sometimes he is, right? Like when he talks about himself and other Jews potentially being grafted in if some of the people of the nations are lopped off. But he also is clearly talking about a spiritual aspect to this. In verse 29, he is a Jew who is one on the inside. And his circumcision is that of the heart by spirit, not by a written code. The praise of that one comes not from men, but from God. When, what then is the superiority of the Jew? Or what is the benefit of the circumcision? There is a benefit because they were entrusted with the sacred pronouncement of God. But then their number decreased so that the people of the nations, the full number, right? That's what Paul said, would come in and in this way all Israel be saved. So we have clearly given to us in Romans a letter written to people of the nations descriptions of them being spiritual Jews on the inside of them being people of the nations whose full number comes in is grafted into the first fruits the root and in that manner all Israel being saved now let's go further with this idea of first fruits and the 12 tribes that are mentioned in Revelation 7 the first fruits being bought from the earth in Revelation 14 Let's go to Romans 8, 19 through 23. We'll stay in Romans a little bit. So we read Romans 11, Romans 2, connected those with descriptions that we read in Revelation 6, 7, and 14 in regards to the number that is given. Romans chapter 8. Notice what he writes here in verses 19 through 23. For the eager expectation of the creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And remember, it talked about them being sons in the descriptions we read in Revelation 7 and 14. We'll get back to that in a moment in terms of the gender. For the creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but through him that subjected it on the basis of hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from enslavement to corruption and have the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that all creation keeps groaning together and being in pain together until now. Not only that, but we ourselves also who have the first fruits. Namely the spirit, right? The circumcision is by what? The inside, the heart, by spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves while we are earnestly waiting for adoption as sons. Is he only talking to males here? Is this just for men? Well, the context of the, of the letter shows that, the, no, that's not the case. But when they write about being those who belong to Christ and who are going to be raised together with him, 
just like the sons of God are all spoken of as sons of God and Jesus as the son of God, there's no gender really like we have it on earth in heaven. They're all sons of God. Even if Jesus, for example, is presented as wisdom in a feminine sense, but not as a female, right? Or So even Paul goes on to say there's neither male nor female. We'll get to that in a moment. So he's talking about how we're viewed in relation to Christ, not our actual literal gender, or even our actual literal heritage in the cases in which he's describing the sons of God as being circumcised of the heart by spirit, having the first fruits, waiting for adoption as sons and the release from our bodies by ransom. That's what he's talking about. Not in a bodily, physical sense as though it relates to specific gender. And we're going to discuss this further in a moment, but I want to point that out here. But it's important that we recognize that Paul also describes them as having the first fruits. In addition to being grafted into the first fruits, the root, Israel, as branches. Now let's go to the book of James, chapter 1. We're talking about this idea of being out of the tribes of Israel bought from the earth as first fruits. James chapter 1. Descriptions that are explicitly given to the 144,000 in Revelation 7 and 14, as we, we read, right? Out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, we've already read now that all Israel is saved by the full number of the people of the nations being grafted in, and that we have the first fruits of the spirit that is the circumcision of the heart, a spiritual Jewishness. James chapter 1. The main question really is, you know, are the 144,000 the same as the Christians who are described all throughout the New Testament? Or are they some separate group, you know, that's uniquely described in the ways that we've been talking about? Well, so far... It seems like the, the Christians outside of Revelation 7 and 14 have those same descriptions, at least where it involves the full number of them, of being first fruits. And in what sense they are out of all Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. James 1, uh, 1, 1 first. And then we'll go to James 1, 17 through 18. Look at this. James starts out, right? This is not a letter given, you know, like a vision, right? Maybe have um, figurative references and things. But it's not like Revelation, where it starts out as a vision given to John, or, or Revelation with a bunch of visions in it. Revelation given to Jesus and a bunch of visions given to John. James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, writes to whom? Is he writing to Jews here? Just Jews? Well, the context of his letter does not support that. And we're not going to read the whole letter of James. I've translated it, though, and you can read it, but you'll see he's not talking about only Jews. Yet he addresses his letter to whom? The twelve tribes scattered about. He's not talking about the diaspora scattering of Jews in a literal sense. He's talking to his brothers, his Christian brothers, who are facing trials. Just like he is a slave of God. We have several of the same descriptions given in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, right? Those who are resting on the altar and they cry out and they're told to rest until the full number comes in. They're described as slaves of God. And then the brothers are the ones whose full number come in. And then we get the 12 tribes listed several verses after that in Revelation 7. Here, James calls himself a slave of God, just like those sleeping under the altar in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. To the twelve tribes, just like Revelation 7, 1 through 5, all the tribes listed. And he's talking to his brothers, 
the ones who are referred to in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, as the ones who haven't been sealed yet, whose full number hasn't come in. This is an explicit use, not only of brothers and slave in relation to Revelation 6, 9 through 11, but of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7. The Christians are called the 12 tribes. Just like Paul calls people of the nations Jews, not on the outside, but on the inside. Just like he says they're going to be grafted into the first fruits, that they have the first fruits, the spirit that circumcises them on the inside so that they are a spiritual Jew. And in this manner, as the number of them come in, all Israel is saved. Now let's jump down to verses 17 and 18, where he goes on to write, Every good gift and every perfect present is from above. It comes down from the Father of the celestial heights. And with him there's not a variation of the turning of the shadow. Because he willed it. He brought us forth by the word of truth. To be certain first fruits of his creatures. Are you seeing a pattern here, everyone? It's... <laughs> it, it's... Pretty clear to me, and we're not done by a long shot, right? We still got the virgin stuff, not being defiled women, but so far, where it gets to the number in Revelation 7 and 14, and referenced, but without a specific number, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, right before the specific number is given in relation to the 12 tribes that James addresses at the opening of his letter, who are said to be bought from among mankind as first fruits. Just like Paul says, we're grafted into as first fruits. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. There's definitely connections made all over the place in what the early Christians were writing about each other and what John sees in the visions given to him about the 144,000. Let's go back to Revelation 21, Revelation and into uh, chapter 21 briefly, uh, again on this whole idea of the number, the 12 tribes being slaves were bought from the earth. Revelation 21, 9 through 12. Right, so is this reference in Revelation 7 and 14, specifically 7 in relation to the 12 tribes, figurative? Or is that literal? Well, we, we can already see from James it doesn't appear it's always literal. And the way Paul writes in Romans 2, 8, and 11, there's a basis for not taking it as literal. What about Revelation 21, 9 through 12? And there came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, which were full of the seven plagues, and he spoke with me and said, Come here. I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Very important description to remember. Excuse me. So he carried me away in the power of the Spirit to a great and lofty mountain. A great and lofty mountain. Could that be the Mount Zion on which the Lamb and the 144,000 were standing in Revelation 14? We'll get to that in a moment, but I think there is a connection here. A great and lofty mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. From God, out of heaven, which is where the 144,000 were, because that's where their, the sound of their singing came from, as they're on that Mount Zion with the Lamb. Here, the Lamb's wife appears in association with the vision of a great and lofty mountain, and Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, suggesting that mountain is in heaven, having the glory of God its radiance was like a most precious stone, as a jasper stone, shining crystal clear. It had a great and lofty wall and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And the names were inscribed, which are those of the twelve 
tribes of the sons of Israel. This appears to me to be another reference to the 12 tribes in a figurative sense, not in the literal sense, the actual physical fleshly 12 tribes, but of the spiritual 12 tribes that James is writing to in James 1.1, 1, 1, who are first fruits, James 1.17-18, 1, that Paul also describes in relation to the people of the nations being grafted into the first fruits, having the first fruits by being Jews, circumcised of the heart by spirit, and by whose number coming in, all Israel is saved. Here we have the Lamb's wife on this great and lofty mountain being shown in association with New Jerusalem coming out of heaven and having the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, the names of them listed on it, just like we see referenced in Revelation 7. Okay, now let's talk about this being sealed, which, which came up as well, right? Of course, in Revelation chapter 7, um, the number of those sealed out of the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's go to Revelation 9, 4, since we're already in Revelation. What is this sealing in their foreheads? Well, notice how it's contrasted with other individuals who don't have that seal. Here, after the fifth angel blows its trumpet, it says... Well, let's go ahead and read. We'll read several verses. It says the fifth. I saw. Well, let's start in Revelation eight thirteen. It says, "And I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven, with a loud voice." We actually might come back and do this section. Well, we'll do it now, because it, it might come up again in another part of the description. So we'll just read it all now. I was going to focus just on verse four of chapter nine, but let's read from Revelation eight thirteen through nine four. And I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven with a loud voice. Woe, woe, woe to those dwelling on the earth because the rest of the trumpet blasts of the three angels who were about to blow their trumpets. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw that had fallen from heaven to the earth and the key of the pit of the abyss was given to him. And this reminds me at least of the fact that Jesus saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And in Revelation 12, he's of course thrown out of heaven by Michael at the establishment of God's kingdom and the authority of his Christ. And the key of the pit of the abyss was given him. And he opened the pit of the abyss and smoke ascended out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun was darkened, also the air, by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts came forth upon the earth, and authority was given to him, given them. And the same authority as the scorpions of the earth have. And they were told to harm no vegetation of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. Just like we read in Revelation 7, where it says, don't harm the earth or the trees or the sea until we've sealed the slaves of our God in their foreheads. In the same way, these locusts are told to harm no vegetation of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We might be having a little interruption with YouTube, I'm getting to notice, but I'm going to keep going and I'll upload the video later if there's a significant portion missing. Do you notice that here, the connection between Revelation 7 and not harming any of the trees until the number of those are sealed? Here, the locusts that come out after this star falls from heaven are told not to harm any, any tree, but only those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. All right, now keep that in mind and let's take that with us and go to 2 Corinthians 1. 
We're talking about this seal that is given to the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7. 2 Corinthians. We're going to go ahead and read chapter 1, just verse 22 for now. Notice what it says. And again, we don't read the full context of all these texts because you can do that on your own. But the, the full context aren't always about the specific descriptions that we're reading in relation to the descriptions that are given to the 144,000. So that's why I'm not always reading a lot of the context. It doesn't, it's not necessary. Sometimes it is like with Romans 11, but other times it's not where we just get a quick specific description given in the context of the opening of a letter or other narratives. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22 Well, let's go ahead and read verse 21. But he who guarantees that you and we belong to Christ and who has anointed us is God. He has also put his seal upon us and given us the token of what is to come. That is the spirit in our hearts. What did Paul say in Romans 2 and 11? Is the spirit... In relation to our hearts, it's that which circumcises us as spiritual Jews and shows we have what? The first fruits. Here, he combines that spirit in our hearts with the seal that God puts upon us. The 144,000 are sealed. Those who are allowed to be harmed by the locusts in Revelation 9 don't have that seal. Now let's take a look at Ephesians 1.13. Again, we're trying to note parallel descriptions between the early Christians and the 144,000 to determine if these are the same groups or if there's a different group of people specifically limited to 144,000 in addition to the Christians who are also said to be numbered or to have the full number of the Gentiles coming in to the root of Israel, the first fruits, and by that manner all Israel being saved. The twelve tribes who are bought or chosen as first fruits according to James 1 1, 17 through 18. Keep my reading voice here. Ephesians 1, verse 13. But you also hoped in him after you heard the word of truth, the good news about your salvation, by means of him also, after you believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, a token in advance of our inheritance for the purpose of a releasing, by a ransom, God's own possession, to his glorious praise. Once again, we get this connection between the Spirit and our sealing, being sealed, like the 144,000 are described as being sealed, with the early Christians also being described as the 12 tribes. Since we're in Ephesians, let's go ahead and look down to chapter 4, verse 30. Notice what it says here. Also do not be grieving God's Holy Spirit with which you have been sealed for a day of releasing by ransom. So this was a very well-known idea and concept among the early Christians who are spoken of as Jews circumcised of the heart, grafted into the root of Israel, the first fruits, and that by the full number of the nations or those who are regrafted in, after having been broken off, literal Jews, all Israel, the 12 tribes of James, is saved. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this idea of Mount Zion further. Remember, we read earlier in Revelation 21, 9 through 12, how the Lamb's bride was on this great and lofty mountain in heaven. And we read in Revelation 14 how the 144,000 are with the Lamb 
in heaven because that's the location out of which their singing comes. And it talked about that mountain in chapter 14 of Revelation being Mount Zion. So let's see if we get additional references to Mount Zion that we can connect with the 144,000 being on Mount Zion in Revelation chapter 14. Let's go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. I told you, if you came here for the Bible today, that's what you were going to get. Because we don't need to go outside of the Bible in order to understand most of these things, if not everything that's written for us in these texts. Revelation, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. You yourselves also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house for the purpose of a holy priesthood. Remember that. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. For it is contained in Scripture, Look, I am laying in Zion a stone, chosen, a foundation cornerstone, precious, and no one exercising faith in it will by any means come to disappointments. Verse 7, It is you, Therefore, that is, that he is precious. It is to you, therefore, that he is precious, because you are believers. But to those not believing, the identical stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock mass of, of offense, kind of like what Paul talks about in Romans 11. These are, the, these are stumbling because they are disobedient to the word. To this very end, they, are, they were also appointed. Verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Well, the twelve tribes were what? The nation of Israel. They're referred to in Revelation 7 as that nation. They're referred to by James as a twelve-tribe nation. Here by Peter, they're a holy priesthood, a chosen race, right? Even though we know the people of the nations were what? Multiple races, in addition to the Jewish Christians. Here, they're one race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, not nations. One nation, a people for special possession, that you should declare abroad the excellencies of the one that called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. For you were once not a people, but are now God's people. You were those who had not been shown mercy, but are now those who have been shown mercy. So it appears here that Peter is doing something similar to what we see being told to John or showed to John in Revelation that the Christians are a nation, a spiritual nation, a priesthood, a race that is described in relation to the original root, that is Israel, the first fruits, into which other races are grafted in to become one. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. We'll read verses 18 through 28. Listen to this. For you have not approached that which can be felt and which can be set aflame with fire and a dark cloud and a thick darkness and a tempest. Like in the Old Testament accounts, the actual things that took place in a physical sense. And the blare of a trumpet and the voice of words on hearing which voice the people implored that no word should be added to them. He says, you have not approached that. All right, so this, this is something different. So in Revelation 14, it's talking about Mount Zion, right? But, but it seems to be in heaven, like that great and lofty mountain in heaven in Revelation 21. And here, he, the author of Hebrews is saying, you haven't approached that which can be felt like a literal mountain. For the command was not bearable to them. And if a beast touches the mountain, it must be stoned. Also, the display was so fearsome that Moses said, I am fearful and trembling. 
but you have approached a Mount Zion and a city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, just like the Lamb's wife was described in Revelation 21 as coming down out of heaven from that great and lofty mountain, Mount Zion, a place that can't be felt, a heavenly Jerusalem. In the general assembly and the congregation of the firstborn who have been enrolled in the heavens. And God, the judge of all and the spiritual lives of, the, of righteous ones who have been made perfect. And Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, the blood of sprinkling which speaks in a better way than Abel's, see that you do not beg off from him who is speaking. For if they did not escape who begged off from him who was giving divine warning upon earth, much more shall we not if we turn away from him who speaks from the heavens. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying yet once more, I will set in commotion not only the earth, but also the heavens. See, both again, right? Just like Peter we'll get to again in a moment. And just like John, a new heavens and a new earth. But when we're talking about the 144,000 and the early Christians and the hope they expressed, while it did involve both, just like here, he's going to set into commotion once more, not only the earth, but also the heaven. They're clearly depicted with the Christ in heaven on that heavenly great mountain Mount Zion, at least if we're connecting the descriptions of Revelation 7 and 14 with what is elsewhere said consistently to be the description of the early Christians. Now the expression yet once more signifies the removal of things being shaken as things that have been made in order that the things not being shaken may remain. Again, a new heavens and a new earth and in these, plural, righteousness is to dwell. New Jerusalem, the Lamb's wife, that bride that we read about, Revelation 21, 9 through 14, earlier in that same chapter of Revelation 21, comes down over whom? Mankind. Verse 28, Wherefore, seeing that we are to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us continue to have undeserved kindness through which we may acceptably render God sacred service with godly fear and awe. So there's definitely a clear understanding among the early Christians before John received the revelation about the 144,000 being bought from the earth as first fruits first roots, out of the 12 tribes of Israel, one nation, the 12 tribes scattered about on Mount Zion in heaven, a heavenly place. This was the same hope and beliefs that all the Christians in the first century had. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this idea of being defiled with women, virgins, right? That seems to be explicit, does it not? Of course, we're dealing with Revelation, like we said, being presented in signs to John, Revelation 1.1. But sometimes things can be literal. Sometimes things might be what they're actually said to be, like the descriptions given of Jesus, although they're metaphorical for his heavenly body in Revelation 1 and 2. They still represent actual things. So is this true also for being virgins? Does it represent actual virginity in a physical sense? And is that why they're chosen? Because they didn't defile themselves in that way with women. Well, the Bible doesn't speak negatively of not being a virgin. Right? Paul, even in 1 Corinthians 7, says you'll do well. He doesn't prohibit it, like Catholics do to their priests today. So the idea of being a virgin, even Peter wasn't a virgin, right? Many of the early Christians weren't virgins. So all these descriptions that we've been tying together from first fruits to being the Israel of God, the 12 tribes, slaves, brothers, the full number being grafted into the first fruits, being bought as certain first fruits, chosen as first fruits. 
so this idea of virginity, that's not looked down upon unless you, you're someone who's married, right? And in, specifically in the Bible, adultery is when a married man or a man or a woman has relations with someone who is married. We'll get to that in another show, but that's how it's described in the Bible. So is that what it's talking about when it speaks of being defiled with women? Let's take a look at how the Bible speaks of the New Testament Christians as virgins and of being defiled or not defiled. And then we'll move on to this without blemish and no falsehoods. Let's go first to Revelation 3.4. Since in Revelation 14, that's where it describes them as being virgins and not defiling themselves with women. So in Revelation 3, 4, notice what the risen Jesus says to those in Sardis. He says, you do have a few names in Sardis that did not defile their outer garments. And they'll walk with me in white ones because they are worthy. And he also speaks in these, um, like right here in Revelation 2, 20, he speaks about, he's talking to those in Theotera, Theotera, tolerating that woman Jezebel and teaching and misleading his slaves. Again, that's how the 144,000 it describes as his slaves to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Right, And he's, he's not talking about a literal Jezebel, right? Is Jezebel alive right now? No. No, she was killed a long time ago in a way befitting her. But here he's referring to some kind of spiritual woman whom he calls Jezebel in relation to his slaves committing fornication, right? And the people in Sardis weren't all virgins. But he talks about those committing adultery with her and fornication. And he he talks about this spiritual woman repenting of her fornication. So there's definitely a spiritualization of this kind of sexual activity that the risen Jesus is condemning and that he says his slaves are committing and should stop committing. But let's go further with this. Let's talk about it in the context of 2 Peter. Let's go back there. 2 Peter chapter 2. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 10, it's in First Peter there. Excuse me. We'll read, we'll read 9 and 10 to just get the right context. He talks about Jehovah. Again, I talked about the use of the, new, of the divine name of the New Testament earlier and my other videos. I don't necessarily agree with it being used here, but we're going to use the NWT anyway. Jehovah knows how to deliver people of godly devotion out of trial, but to preserve or reserve unrighteous people for the day of judgment to be cut off. Especially, however, those who do not go after flesh with the desire to defile it. So there's definitely this idea of an excessive involvement with flesh that could be considered defilement. But is this is this in addition to being a virgin? Right? So we can see here there's definitely a sense in which flesh can be gone after and be defiled. But Revelation 14 also said explicitly, did it not? They're virgins. Is there anywhere else in the New Testament where we can find a use of virgins for the Christians that's not literal? And then potentially use that as a basis for not understanding that they are virgins in Revelation 14, in a book that's not always literal? Let's take a look at, first let's go to James one twenty seven. James one twenty seven, And again, I know we're moving around, but again, we're just looking at descriptions. They're not always necessary to understand by reading the full context of these different letters because it's within the letters that specific descriptions are given outside of or inside of the, the narrative, but not as necessary to it. They're just additional descriptions that are added, but that relate to our overall subject, the 144,000. Who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? 
Well, so far, it seems like they may be actual Christians, Jews and non-Jews, people of the nations, who come in to fill up the full number so that all Israel is saved. And they're referred to as 12 tribes outside of Revelation, for example, in James 1.1. So we're back in James now, and here he refers to the form of worship that is clean and undefiled from the standpoint of our God and Father, namely to look after orphans and widows in their tribulation, and to keep yourself without spot from the world. So these terms come up again, right? Undefiled, clean, without spot, without blemish. Now let's go to Romans 14, 12 through 14. We're trying to identify how the early Christians described themselves. Are they consistent in their descriptions of each other with how the 144,000 are described in Revelation chapters 7 and 14. Romans 14, 12 through 14. He states, So then each of us will render an account for himself to God. Therefore let us not be judging one another any longer, but rather make this your decision not to, to put before a brother a stumbling block or a cause for tripping. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is defiled in itself. Only where a man considers something to be defiled, to him it is defiled. So there is also a sense in which our defilement can relate to how we ourselves perceive a thing as defiled or not, and then act according to our own conscience. It's just important that you have a full understanding of the senses in which the early Christians use this term defile or without defilement. But again, right, Revelation does explicitly seem to link it with virginity. It says that they are virgins. In fact, they are virgins. So do we have anything explicit in that sense which we can tie together with this idea of being virgins in a non-literal sense? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're pointing out various descriptions that are given that show or don't show a connection between the descriptions that are given in Revelation chapter 7 and 14 for the 144,000. 2 Corinthians 11. What we're really trying to focus on now is this idea of virginity. Are the 144,000 literal virgins? If so, well, then we have a number of shared descriptions to this point, all of which fit both the 144,000 and the early Christians, many of whom were not literal virgins. So is this 144,000 just maybe some special group among, er, among Christians that are actual virgins? 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. I wish you would put up with me in some little unreasonableness, but in fact, you are putting up with me. Thank you for joining me, by the way. Thank you for putting up with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I personally promised you in marriage to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to the Christ. The Corinthians were not all virgins. Paul even wrote to them in his first letter about how it's not bad to be a virgin. That you'd do well. Here he explicitly uses the idea of marriage, right? Who is described as the lamb's wife, the lamb's bride in Revelation 21 and elsewhere in Revelation. If you connect the great and lofty mountain that the lamb's bride is descending from is Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, the same heavenly Mount Zion in Jerusalem that the author of Hebrews refers to as we read earlier, where the 144,000 are standing with the Christ as they sing out of heaven as virgins, that lamb's wife, well, how, you know, are, is, is that a separate wife and, and then the other Christians who aren't the 144,000 are also going to marry the the lamb's uh, the lamb 
Possibly, but the fact is that we once again get the connection between the Lamb's wife and the early Christians as being promised in marriage to one husband, namely the Christ, as virgins. And they're not literal virgins. Most of them were not virgins. So what's he talking about? Well, he goes on to write, If I'm afraid somehow, as the serpent seduced Eve by his cunning, your minds might be corrupted away from the sincerity and chastity that are due the Christ. For as it is, if someone comes and preaches that Jesus other than the one we preached, like being a second person of a triune God, versus one God, the Father, and the Son of God, or you receive a spirit other than what you receive, like a third person of God, not a spirit that's sent from God and the Christ, like in the Trinity, or good news other than what you accepted, like all these other different presentations of dates and information that are not explicitly stated in these texts, you easily put up with them. That's what he's talking about. Just like I read earlier when I was referring to those texts that talk about defilement and being spotless. The virginity and and spotlessness or non-defilement is in relation to the marriage to the Christ and the sincerity and chastity do him by not letting our minds be corrupted away from him. That's why the, the Christians, the 144,000, they do what? They follow whom? The Lamb. Where? No matter where he goes. You're not supposed to have your minds corrupted away and therefore not follow the Lamb wherever he goes. The Christ. That's the virginity we have to have in our marriage to the husband that is the Christ the lamb, as his wife, so that we're not seduced like Eve because of people that come and preach another Jesus or talk about another spirit or tell us about another good news, right? The same things similar to what Paul talks about in Galatians 1. We're not supposed to be listening to those things. We're promised in marriage, everyone. <laughs> We have to follow the Lamb no matter where He goes. And if someone tells us about a different Jesus and tries to tell us about another good news or another spirit, reject them. Put them to the test like the Ephesian Christians did in Revelation 2.2 2, and then the Lamb will approve you and you'll be considered a chaste virgin to the Christ. It's explicit. It's explicit as Revelation 14 is explicit, and I don't think you can miss it if you read these texts the way we've been doing it today. By comparing the descriptions that are given of the 144,000 who are seen in heaven on heavenly Mount Zion, the same place that the Christians believed they would be as part of the new heavens and new earth, 2 Peter 3.13, Revelation 21, mankind is present. But so are the ones chosen to be with the Christ. Let's take a look at one more text in relation to this idea of being a chaste virgin or without blemish. Galatians chapter 3. Thank you all for joining me. I hope this has been enjoyable for you. Because we also read about how they were sons, right? And how they didn't defile themselves with women, right? And although I mentioned that you you could be a woman and defile yourself by performing an unnatural act like lesbo or getting involved with a married man, which is adultery, according to the Bible. We'll talk about it in another show. It may imply that those are just men, right? Well, again, it's not always speaking about literal gender in those ways. And all of the early Christians, including women, are referred to as sons. To be adopted as sons. 
not in a specific gender sense. And notice how Paul makes that clear here in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. You are all, all of you, in fact, sons of God through your faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, who were baptized into Christ, have put on the Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. It's not talking about literal Jews in Revelation 7 or 14, or even in Romans 2. Literal Jews can be involved, just like we read in, in Romans 11, just like Paul. Just like Jews who were broken off and can be grafted back in. But that's no longer the case, right? We're one race, like Peter wrote about. A holy nation. And even if we're people of the nations being grafted into the first fruits of the nation, that is the Israel of God, the 12 tribes that James writes, writes to, the first fruits, it's a spiritual representation of a nation, of 12 tribes, of Jews. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor freeman. There is neither male nor female. Who's he writing to? Sons of God. There's neither male nor female. If you are a son of God, for you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. Moreover, if you belong to Christ, you are really Abraham's seed. Spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel, once again, heirs with reference to a promise. Now let's talk about this without blemish, no, no falsehood. Two terms that are also used to describe in addition to not being defiled, right? Or virgins in the sense in which Paul made explicit, right? In 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Let's look at Colossians 1, 21 through 23 as we go through these descriptions between the early Christians and the 144,000, Revelation 7 and 14, to see if they're consistent. Are we talking about the same people here, just presented in signs to John, similar to how the same references are used in other New Testament letters and books? Colossians 1, 21 through 23, Indeed, you were once alienated and enemies because your minds were on the works that were wicked. He has now again reconciled by means of that one's fleshly body through his death, in order to present you holy and unblemished. They are without blemish. Revelation 14, 144,000. And open to no accusation before him, provided, of course, that you continue in the faith, that you're not lopped off like Romans 11 made plain established on the foundation and steadfast, not being drifted away from the hope of the good news, right, being chaste virgins to the Christ, not having our minds corrupted away by wrong influence about people who lie to us about Jesus and the Spirit and the good news. Which you heard and which was preached in all creation is under heaven. Of this good news, I, Paul, became a minister. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Note these descriptions between the early Christians and the 144,000 of Revelation 7 and 14. Keep doing all things free from murmurings and arguments. These Trinitarians love to run around and argue, don't they? I had one just the other day tell me that what he really needs is a debate between me and someone. Well, I've already done that between several with several someones. How many times do you need to see it before it's done? Well, there are some people who just love to do things around arguments. Not you. Not if you're like me and you know what to do. While we will do what we have to do, we need to do all things free from arguments arguments, debates, nonsense, like Paul stated to Timothy, 
that you shouldn't be involving yourself with in the first place unless it's the perfect time, the right situation to give a witness. These people build their whole lives around arguing and apologetics. They're doing everything involving with arguments. They're in no way fulfilling these texts. We'll talk about that more in a moment and how money is so much a part of their arguments and debates and apologetics that you come to the blameless and in, you come to be blameless and innocent. Children of God without a blemish. They're without blemish, the 144,000 in Revelation 14. In among a crooked and twisted generation among whom you are shining as illuminators in the world. They were very aware of how they could be virgins, of how they could be undefiled, of how they could be without blemish. Let's take a look at Ephesians 1.4. Note again the description that is given to these early uh, first century Christians and how it's consistent with what is stated about the 144,000 Revelation 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no trinity. The God of the New Testament is not a triunity. One person, one God the Father. Anyone who tells you anything else, you need to get farther before your mind is corrupted away from the chastity and sincerity that is due the Christ. Your husband, as a Christian virgin, in the sense in which the Bible describes us to be presented. For he blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in union with Christ, just as he chose us in union with him before the founding of the world, the seed, the Messiah, that we would be a part of him as the seed that Paul talks about elsewhere in his writings, that we should be holy and with out blemish before him in love. For he ordained us to be to the adoption through Jesus Christ as sons, not male or female, spiritual sons without blemish, just like the 144,000 are said to be in Revelation 14. Look also at Ephesians 4.25. And what he says here, wherefore, now that you have put away falsehood, right? We're talking about the 144,000. They're without blemish. No falsehood is found in their mouths, Revelation 14 says. We've seen how the we can be without blemish. That was clearly something that the early Christians believed about themselves in spite of being sinful and making mistakes, like Paul says about himself. Now that you have put away falsehood, no falsehood is found in their mouths. Speak truth, each one of you with this neighbor, because we are members belonging to one another. And look what he says here in chapter 5, verse 27. He talks about husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the congregation, delivered himself, that he might sanctify it, cleanse it with the bath of water by means of the word, that he might present the congregation to himself in its splendor, not having a spot, spotless, or a wrinkle, or any such things, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This comes up over and over again in the New Testament writings and fits explicitly the description given of the 144,000 in Revelation 14. Let's go back briefly to 2 Peter and note what he says. I'm trying to draw you a picture of all these New Testament writings, descriptions, and how they're consistent with what John sees in the revelation he was given about the 144,000. The full number of people that come in to the root that is Israel, the first fruits, those who are circumcised of the heart so that all Israel is saved, the 12 tribes, according to James who are chosen as those same first fruits. Second Peter 
2, 12 through 15, these men like unreasoning animals born naturally to be caught and destroyed will in the things of which they are ignorant and speak ab abusively suffer destruction in their own course. Wronging themselves as, as a reward for wrongdoing, they consider luxurious living in the daytime of pleasure. They are spots and blemishes, indulging with unrestrained delight in their deceptive teachings while feasting together with you. They have eyes full of adultery, unable to resist sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have a heart trained in covetousness. They are accursed children, abandoning the straight path. They have been misled. They have followed the path of Balaam, of Beor, who loved the reward of wrongdoing. And just like in Revelation, right, Jesus warns those from following the sin of Balaam. That woman Jezebel, who was leading his slaves, a description also given to the 144,000, into committing this kind of fornication she was known for. Let's take a look at 2 Peter 3. I referenced it earlier briefly. 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14, but there are a new heavens. This is Peter's hope. right? A New Testament Christian, a follower of Jesus, someone appointed to feed his little sheep, whom Paul had to correct it, or he wouldn't have continued to be one of Jesus' sheep. There are a new heavens and a new earth we are waiting according to his promise. And in these righteousness is to dwell. Stop lying to people, you false Christians who continue to deprive people of the hope of a new earth and only talk about the new heavens and about our birth or adoption as sons. Whether or not we are in heaven with the Christ or not, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And the Lamb's bride descends out of heaven to that new earth to be with mankind. If you can't present the hope of people like Peter and John that is described as being the Lamb's wife with mankind, then stop teaching the New Testament. You're not qualified. You need to present the full hope of the Scriptures. A new heavens and a new earth. And in these, plural, righteousness is to dwell. Hence, Beloved ones, since you are awaiting these things, they were awaiting the new heavens and new earth. You false Christians who only talk about a new heavens, who only talk about your heavenly reward. They were awaiting both. Do your utmost to be found finally by him, spotless and unblemished. And in peace. Unlike all the Trinitarian apologetic nuts who run around trying to steal our peace while well, they argue all the time when we're told not to do it. Jude 1, 24. Let's get to it. Jude 24 and 25. We're almost done, everyone. But let's conclude this right. Now to the one who is able to guard you from stumbling and to set you unblemished. Just like the 144,000 in Revelation 14. In the sight of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, might and authority for all past eternity now and into all eternity. Amen. This is where your mind should be to keep from being corrupted away from your virginity and being presented spotless and unblemished to the Christ. Think of these things. Be on guard from stumbling. Stay unblemished. Don't go around those who just want to contaminate you with their false Jesus, their false spirit, and their fake good news. We've had enough of it. Let's go back to this idea of being sealed. Just like the 144,000 are said to be sealed in their foreheads. 
just like the Christians are spoken of in the New Testament as being sealed with the promised Holy Spirit that circumcises us of the heart as spiritual Jews, as first fruits, the very first fruits that are bought from the earth in Revelation 14. The 144,000 spiritual Israel. It does not appear to me to be a literal number, but a number that is literal and filled by the grafting in of the nation so that all Israel, the 12 tribes, are saved. Revelation 8, 13. We read this earlier, but let's go back to it again briefly before we conclude with another text in Revelation 13. So we talked about how these individuals who are allowed to be harmed don't have the seal of God, right? We read this earlier, how this star falls from heaven, releases the locusts, but they can't harm the trees. They can only harm those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. But look at, remember, back in Revelation 7:1 which we read earlier, the angels are holding fast the four corners of the earth that no wind might blow upon the earth or the sea or any tree. Until after we have sealed the slaves of our God in their foreheads. What does this mean? What is this seal? Revelation 22. Read it with me. Our concluding text, Revelation 22, 1 through 5. And he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, flowing out from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of its broad way, and on this side of the river and on that side, trees of life producing 12 crops of fruit, yielding their fruits each month. And the leaves of the trees were for the curing of the nations. And no more will there be any curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will render him sacred service. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Also, night will be no more, and they have no need of lamplight or sunlight, because Jehovah God will shed light upon them, and they will rule as kings forever and ever. The seal is God's name on their foreheads. And it shows right here what they're going to do, does it not? In addition to being with the Lamb, singing with harps, playing on their harps, on heavenly Mount Zion as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, they'll rule as kings forever and ever. And just to complement this last text with one other text that will make our last text, let's go to Revelation 5 which also speaks of these, not only kings, but priests, just like the author of Hebrews and Peter referred to when he said that they are holy priests, one nation, one race, a kingdom, a nation, Israel, the 12 tribes. Revelation 5 says, that when he took the scroll, it says, let's start in verse 6. He talks about the lion that is of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, having conquered to open the scroll and its seals. And I saw standing in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, a lamb, as though it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which eyes mean 
the seven spirits of God that have been sent forth into the whole earth. The seven spirits, by the way, that are referenced in Revelation 1, 4 as with God and Jesus and who send greetings. The lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which mean the seven spirits that are sent forth. What did Jesus say in John 14 and 15 he would send forth? The Holy Spirit. Whether it's one or one of several spirits, this is how they're described in Revelation as seven spirits. Sending greetings and being sent by the Lamb. He has those seven spirits that are sent forth into the whole earth. And that Lamb went and at once took out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. Where is the Son of Man? Where was he before he takes this out of his right hand? At the right hand of this one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls that were full of incense. And the incense means the prayers of the holy ones. And they sing a new song. Just like the 144,000 are singing a new song that only they can master. And that doesn't mean they're the 24 elders because they could have learned that song from the elders they're distinct from and then mastered it. You understand? So whereas the Watchtower Society identifies these as the same groups, they don't have to be. They could just be 24 elders in heaven who already know the song and who sing it and that the 144,000 who are bought from the earth for God as first fruits then learn and master from these same 24 elders who have the harps that the 144,000 then are given when they're on Mount Zion with the Lamb. These sing, that is, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, a new song, the same song that the 144,000 master saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered. And with your blood, you bought persons for God out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. But yet, according to Peter, we're one nation, right? But yet they come out of all nations because just like Paul wrote in Romans 11, we're grafted into the one root. That is that one nation, a spiritual Israel. The Israel of God, the 12 tribes of James who are bought and chosen as first fruits. And you made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they are to rule as kings over the earth. The same kings who are ruling over the earth in Revelation 8 and 22, 22 specifically, I should say, who have the seal of God on their foreheads, which is the name of God. All of these connections seem to me to be pretty clear. Once you understand what's going on here, and that is at times they are, of course, referred to as people from all nations, because it's people from all nations who are grafted in to the chosen nation that is represented as a spiritual group of people, as spiritual Jews, regardless of whether they're people of the nations, who have the first fruits, the spirit of God, the circumcision of the heart, who are virgins without blemish, spotless, undefiled by being uncorrupted in their mind, by knowing the right Jesus, by knowing the right spirit, by knowing and proclaiming the right good news. They are a kingdom, a holy nation, like Peter referred to, priests to God, who are presented in marriage to the Lamb and who then stand with him, just like Jesus said, 
We would be with him in John 14. He would go away and prepare a place and come back and we would be with him and sing this new song that we learn and that we master because we follow the lamb no matter where he goes. He's the master. And as that bride of the lamb, as new Jerusalem that has the 12 tribes of Israel inscribed upon it, and the name of God is a seal on our foreheads and his spirit in our hearts, we descend to the new earth and we fulfill the promises of God.